Hi, this is the advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of the Complete Herbal Guide. Today we have David Essel, a number one best selling author. He's a counselor, a master life coach, an international speaker, radio TV host, and a minister whose mission is to positively affect two million or more people a day in every area of their life, regardless of their current circumstances. Celebrity Jenny McCarthy says that David Essel is the leader of the positive thinking movement. David's newest top selling books are Helping Americans Heal, The Ultimate Guide to Healing During the Challenging Times, and The Ultimate Gratitude Journal, 52 Weeks to a New You. I love it. I, you know, I just wrote a gratitude journal. I'm all for it. Yay! Awesome, Stacey. That is awesome. Great to be with you. It's great to be with you too. So why don't you tell our audience and our listeners all about yourself and what you do? Well, everything in the world except for politics, Stacey. There isn't a topic <laughs> that we don't cover except for politics. I stay way away from that stuff. But I hear you. <laughs> Me too. You know, and, and so really, you know, our work is about life enhancement, uh, personal growth. You know, we, we work with everything from the very serious sides of life, the incest and rape, uh, you know, helping people overcome huge trauma. And then we help people build businesses. We help people let go of addictions, save marriages, um, change their attitudes. You know, so every topic in the world we cover, except for politics, is really the love of my life. And um, a lot of people like to niche out. You know, they like to, in, in the world of coaching or counseling, know that they work just with weight loss or just with positive thinking or whatever it might be. But, you know, we really, and I myself, just love all of these topics so much. And I love the fact, Stacey, that every hour is a different type of client. You know, I, I might have the, the very first client today who's about an individual trying to decide should they sell their business, sell their house and move, you know, to another part of the country. And then the very next one was someone that's trying to been trying to let go of alcohol for a very long time. And it's the first time they've worked with a professional. Yeah. So I like the change. You know, I really love the variety. Um, I started 43 years ago in this work, uh, and I was in the world of athletics. I, I played basketball at Syracuse University, got wow. a degree in in sports psychology, and um, and so the first 10 years of my life was all about athletes and you know the mind of the athlete, right? And then right. health and health and fitness uh, people that needed to up their game mentally. It was all mental. And in 1990, I got my first client that was based in relationships and I fell in love with relationship work. Right. Yeah. So, and then, you know, I, I had a failed suicide attempt myself in 1990, as strange as this was, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, I had healed from the failed suicide attempt and then went ahead and started this work in relationships. And I was blown away, you know, at how little people know or still know about healthy relationships. Yeah. Uh, a recent study that came out, and you mentioned my book, Helping Americans Heal. And we have articles in that book. There's about a hundred different writings, Stacy, on everything that you and I are talking about from relationships to depression, to addiction. And the American Psychological Association recently came out with a survey that was mind blowing in a negative way, but that's why you and I are here to help people to heal. Right. Yes. But what they found in the survey, Stacey, was that 80% of couples, married couples, said their relationship or their marriage has never been worse than it is right now. 79% mm -hmm. of respondents said they have no idea of how to use emotional coping skills to go through the loss of loved ones, the loss of a job, the struggle with money, health struggles. 70, almost 80% of Americans said, we don't have the tools to deal with the stress of the pandemic. Right. And then 40% of respondents said they're dealing with the deepest anxiety or depression they've ever had. So our country is in a mess. Yeah. But you and I and other people like you, Stacey, have the stage to help people heal. I agree. Now, what people don't realize is that 70% of our society comes from dysfunctional families. So mm -hmm. unhealthy behaviors have been passed on from generations to generations, and people don't have the tools. They grew up in a family that possibly might have been dysfunctional. They don't have the healthy tools on how to break that habit. So they go into the next generation or their next family, and they repeat the behaviors, and it's an ongoing cycle. So people, you know, at some point, you know, they, they, you know, and they find usually also that mates also look 
look for people like similar to their parents. So a father figure maybe, or a mother figure, and that person could be dysfunctional, but they'll still look for that person, even right. though they're dysfunctional. So it keeps rolling and rolling. And that has to do with low self-esteem too, not thinking yeah. they can get better. So it's people like you, and like you said, like I, that have to teach them that they are better. Now, I find when I write articles about relationships, people don't have the coping skills. They don't know how to fix it. So what do you tell people when they come into your office and say, I just don't know how to communicate with my spouse or my partner? What do you tell them? What's the first step? Well, you know, the very first step, if we, if we go to the very first step is never date unless you're happy as hell with yourself. Stacy, that's that's tip number one. You I know? like and that tip. And, and it's the biggest mistake people make. Most people get into relationships because they're lonely. They don't want to be alone. They're bored in life. Their boyfriends and girlfriends all are in relationships. And so, you know, it's insane. And when I work with, with individuals who are single that want to, you know, find their love of their life and all this other kind of wonderful things, yeah. I always I always first say, let's look at you. Right. You know, what are your have you forgiven all of your past lovers? Yeah. I don't care what they've done. I don't care how horrendous they treated you. If we don't forgive everyone from our past, we're carrying that negativity yes, forward, right? Very much um, so. You know, you, 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 and you had mentioned something and there's a term for it. We call it the trauma bond. When someone has been raised in an unhealthy environment, which is a lot of people, Mm -hmm. they will then connect with someone who's also been raised in an unhealthy environment because their energies are identical yeah. and it's called the trauma bond. So if someone says, you know, well, I was neglected as a child and the person who they're out on a date with was neglected as a child, they're automatically connected. It's like, and they look at it positively, Stacey. They go, oh my God, you too. I went through the same thing. Oh, we know each other. We're on the same page. We're on the same, but it's not true. No. You know, and the other thing I'll say before we move on to answering your first question um, is that a, a lot of times we do not realize that we have gotten into another dysfunctional relationship no. in, until the time has gone by. And then we say, well, it's better to have someone than not, at least, you know, all of the justifications to stay. So uh, point one, if you're single, get help to get happier than hell. Forgive all of your past partners. Forgive your parents, your siblings, whoever the hell you have to forgive. I agree. Get clean, right? Now, let's go to what you just asked. And that is a couple comes in and they're struggling and they're they're not communicating, which is 80% of the couples right now. Right. You know, and the very first thing we do is we have them individually. Now, I, I do something different, Stacey, in marriage. Count. I don't believe in traditional marriage counseling. We stopped it in 1996, a long time ago. Right. Because- and this is what happened in 1996. I'm working with a couple and it, it happened all the time in marriage counseling. And we're sitting down and they start getting into an argument in the office or on Zoom or on the phone, right? Um, and I remember in 1996, there was this couple and they were just going crazy on each other for about 40 minutes. And I said, hey, time out, time out, time out. I said, I'll tell you what, here's a tip. You guys are paying me to argue. <laughs> just, just think about this tip okay so you're paying me to do something you could do at home for free right hmm. doesn't make sense to me so i'll tell you what i'm going to take responsibility of my practice and i'm not working with you together anymore i'll only work with you individually and from that day stacy that's the only way i do marriage counseling i work with the husband separately from the wife and this is what happens i get them to write down in the very first session everything that attracted them to their partner when they first met. Right. And then I asked them, are those same attractor figures in your existence today? Now, 99% of the time, they'll say no. In the beginning, we were light and fun. We had sex five times a week and we've been together five years and we have sex once a month and we're always on each other's you know, necks and all this kind of stuff. So we say, okay. Then the second question is, what role do you play in the dysfunction of your marriage? You know, um, are you passive aggressive? Do you shut down and isolate? Are you overly aggressive? Are you dominant? Are you so submissive and so codependent you're afraid to rock the boat? You know, so right. we, we try to get them off of their partner's back right away, you know, yeah. because it does take two to create dysfunction. Oh, definitely. 
you know, if, if you're in a relationship with a dysfunctional person and you're healthy, you will leave them. Yeah. Like, if you're in a dysfunctional relationship and you're both unhealthy, you'll stay together yeah. and you'll battle and fight and everything else, you know? So those are the first kind of tips that we take people through. What was, what were you attracted to now that your relationship is dysfunctional? Are those attractor figures still there? What is your role in the dysfunction? Now, the second question is really tough for people because what everyone wants to say is, it's not me. My husband's always late. He doesn't appreciate me. He treats his 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 staff better than he treat. You know, you hear the same stuff all over. Yeah. Again. Okay? And so then I'll say, okay, thank you. Now let's go back to the question: What role do you play? Right. In the dysfunction, right? So we and it only takes Stacy one or two sessions before they're not even mentioning their partner for the next eight, 10, 12 weeks, whatever I work with them. Right. Right. It's magical. And here's the other thing: they feel safe that they can say anything in front of me yeah. and their partner doesn't hear it and they won't give them, be given hell on the ride home, right? Or they won't exactly. be given hell for the next six days. So you can speak openly with me. You can speak honestly. You're in a safe environment, which is the most crucial parts of healing. Right. You've got to work with a professional and you've got to be in a safe space. Oh, a hundred percent. And I think that's great that you break them up because you know what, there's a lot of times... How do you express how you feel towards, you know, your partner when the partner is in the room, you're, they're immediately going to get this, they're going to get defensive and you're going to end up more fighting with each other and who the hell knows what's going to happen on the car ride home and no progress has been made. But when you're, like you said, when you split them up, you could actually open up and you could share emotions and share feelings and share thoughts that you wouldn't even dare tell your partner because they probably right away. You would feel like you're in college debate class and a fight would yeah. start, you know, it, it'll start. And, you know, the thing, too, about having them separately is that it gives them what you're saying is it gives them a chance to vent. They can vent their anger and frustration to me. They can vent their sadness and their tears. They can vent it all without having to worry about their partner saying, oh, my God, here we go again. You know, yeah. like. Like they can really get it out. And then in our work and with marriages, Stacey, a lot of it is in journaling. Yeah. We do a ton of journaling techniques. I mean, my clients do not get away from a session without multiple exercises to do before I see them the next week. Yeah. And that's where the changes take place. You know, people think changes take place in a therapy session. They don't. No. They take place in what you take from that session and apply to your life every day. Exactly. So, you know, so we have them recording um, what went well in their marriage every day before I see them again. And then what were the challenges? So they don't come in going, uh, I think last Wednesday we were good. Right. I'll go, let's let's look at your book. Wednesday was great. Oh, wait a minute, David. I forgot. At six o'clock at night, we got into it again over X, Y and Z. So because they're journaling it, they're not going to forget those experiences that we need to talk about. But the other thing that's cool is this, Stacey is that they're also journaling the positives. So they'll say like, you know, normally I push back. When my husband or wife says this, I argue. I've begun doing what you've taught me, David. I've begun disengaging. So I'll say when my husband says, oh, you should have never cooked that this way. You should have done it this way. The response would be something like, you know, I never thought of that. Thank you. Right. It doesn't mean you have to do anything different. No. What we're doing it's is we're- Knowledge. We're de-escalating, right? We're acknowledging their comment, but we're de-escalating because normally her, and this is a true story, her response would have been, what are you in the kitchen telling me how to, to, to make this food? This is not your place. This is what I do. Right. Now, go back to your whatever. Now, that's just going to create animosity and arguments. Of course. But when you say to someone, you know, I never thought of it that way. Thank you. The end of the conversation. And Holy if- Right. And if her husband were to say, well, finally, you're listening to me. The answer is, you know, honestly, honey, I never thought of it that way. Thank you. And well, it's about time, honey. You know, it's funny. I never thought of it that way. Thank you. So we get into one repetitive response, which decreases by 100 percent the chance of you going south in an argument. If you just coming back with this very neutral statement. Yeah. Thank you, honey. I never thought of it that way eventually he or she is going to stop arguing because there's no ammunition there. 
Exactly. And you know, the person feels like, hey, I've been acknowledged. It makes them feel good as a person. It That's doesn't right. make them feel like, you know, they're being kicked to the side and they're unworthy of themselves. It makes them feel like, hey, she's acknowledging me. She really cares about what I'm thinking. You know, she I'm I'm important. I'm an important factor maybe in her life. And she really respects me. The key word respect. Yeah. Right on. And it doesn't take much to allow someone to know that they've been heard. Right. You know, I mean, it doesn't take anything other than what we're talking about. Thank you very much. I never looked at life that way. I never looked at cooking an onion that way or whatever it is. Yeah. You know? um, but again, you don't have to change behavior as much as you have to acknowledge that they're in your life. Uh, appreciate the fact that they care because, yeah. you know, him making that comment says he cares. Now he may have done it with a crappy voice, a crappy tone. Maybe he's pissed off at something at work and he's taking it out on you. But you can de-escalate. And that's, we, we teach a lot of de-escalation techniques, yeah. Stacey. Um, you know, another one that we use is this. If a couple's in an argument, I'll have one of them say, honey, listen, I love you very much. If we keep going down this pathway, it's going to get really bad, just like it did last week. So I'm going to go for a 45-minute walk. When I come back, can we try to talk about this again? Or I might say, you know, honey, we had a really rough day and now we're in this conversation that could really turn nasty and I don't want to hurt our relationship or our love anymore. It's five o'clock. Could we decide tomorrow at six o'clock to try to talk about this when we're both in a better space? I love it. So, you know, so it's all de-escalation. And once we get that, that whole energy, the negativity, the anger, the, the arguing down, yeah. Stacy, it, it's amazing how many couples come back. Yeah. Uh, you know, 30 to 60 days. Now, this is going to seem like a long time to couples that argue regularly. But when you have a goal and I have my my clients put a goal of not arguing. Well, we'll start we'll start with seven days. I mean, because a lot of couples get into there's there's something called the adrenaline addiction cycle in couples with arguing. And what that means is this. Every time you argue on both sides, there's a release of adrenaline. Right. Adrenaline is the most powerful hormone in the body. It will take you and make you say things and do things. And you, after a fight, an argument, you go, I can't freaking believe I lost control like that. Right. Yeah. But this is the adrenaline addiction cycle. This is how it works. You get into an argument, adrenaline is released. And then if you are able to calm it down a day or two or three days later, it's not there. But let's say five days later, you get into another one. Right. And then three or four days calm down. And then five days later. OK, now we've created a cycle, a pattern, and the body starts to look for arguments because it wants that adrenaline rush. Right. The brain doesn't know that looking for that rush is bad. It's going to lead to divorce or anything. It doesn't know a thing. All it knows is, wow, we have adrenaline every five days. I want that. Yeah. So then we have the roll of the eyes or the. Oh, Oh, or yeah. some kind of a trigger, right? And because the other person is in the adrenaline addiction cycle as well, they're on edge too. Yeah. They're looking for that reason to attack or defend. So we have to look at that. This is not just a lack of emotional coping skills or a lack of communication skills. This is a real physiological issue. Yes, it is. And that becomes an addiction. The brain actually wants that adrenaline. Yeah. It's just, you know, I was an alcoholic for 30 years. I started very young. I started at 12 and I wanted that every day. My brain craved that alcohol, yeah. right? I, mm -hmm. I needed it to relax. I needed it to be social. I needed it to not be angry. I needed it to let go of resentments, you know, right. like everything in the world. That's an addiction. Yes. And couples get into the same addiction with this adrenaline issue when it comes to arguing. And so the more we can de-escalate, the less the chances that that adrenaline will be spiked yeah. and we'll want to go down and fight and argue again. Um, anyone can do this, Stacey, but you're going to have to work with a professional. Yes. Listen, when I have relationship challenges, I go to a professional. Of course. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> right. Because we can't figure this crap out on no. our own. We need someone from the outside with a wide view. Yeah. And for, for everyone with us right now, if you are struggling in relationships and it's very common, just remember de-escalation. Yeah. Google, 
How do I de-escalate my arguments with my boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, partner? Like get engaged with it and then hire someone to really make it work. Right. You know, and, and it's so important because, you know, some people I, I, I have worked with people that they really get that rush. They look for it. They instigate it. That yes. person, their their spouse or their partner will be nice and calm, not looking for anything, just wants an enjoyable day. And that person is purposely trying to nudge them right. because they want that adrenaline rush. And That's right. what it causes, it causes the other person to move away from that person, but they're yeah. not getting it. And then they don't understand where the separation, how did it occur, you know? Right. And, you know, and one thing you mentioned in the beginning that I think is so important, the forgiveness aspect. Yeah. People, you know, for uh, when you don't have, when you're unforgiven and you hold things over your shoulder from everything that happened in your life, that's toxic. And yeah. you are not able to love yourself, care for yourself, or improve yourself when you have so much of that unforgiveness on your shoulder. It weighs yeah. you down to destruction and eventually that's it will destroy you mentally and physically. And Stacy, you're right on. And the other thing that it does is that it makes us jaded against the opposite sex or the same sex, whatever your preference in dating is. Yeah. Um, if you don't forgive everyone who comes into your circle that you may have a romantic romantic interest in is going to pay the price. Yeah, they're going to pay the price of your lack of forgiving other people, because when we don't forgive, we're jaded. We're not trusting we're looking for problems. Yeah. We're looking for someone to do something wrong because something has been done to us in the past and we're carrying that belief forward. All men are dogs. All women want to be are taken care of financially. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's all those kind of negative statements. And when you have that belief system, I don't care how strong you think you are. Eventually, it's going to leak out to the person you're with now. It has to. It has unless. To. Unless, as you said earlier, unless you go ahead and get rid of all of that lack of forgiveness, that resentment, anger, frustration, rage, it's going to carry on and it will affect every relationship going into the future. Now, how do you, what's your, your advice to listeners when they carry so much toxicity where they, they are not forgiven individuals, they hold on to the past and they don't let go. They don't focus on the present. They go into the present with the past over their shoulder in a knapsack. Yeah. How do you, how do you, what, what advice would you give them to say, this is what you have to do to empty that knapsack? Well, the very first thing is, is self-love. If someone truly loves themselves, they want to forgive everyone else so that they don't have to carry the burden. So I'll come about it at the very first day. So I'll talk about, uh, tell me what self-love means to you. And what are examples of how you love yourself? You know, and someone might say, well, I exercise every day. I eat clean. I pray or I meditate. Awesome. And then I'll say, what role do you think forgiving people who have hurt us in the past might play in enhancing our own self-love? So that's the angle I come. You know, I don't come from a moral point of view or an ethical point of view. You should do it because it's the right thing to do. You should do it because that's what Jesus would do right. or Mohammed or Buddha or anyone else. Right? right. It's like, no, what would the benefits be? Well, when I think of them, I get a pit in my stomach. When I think of them, I get angry. When I think of them, I think how disgusting they are. So what if those thoughts were never there? How would your life change? Right. You know, so we look at it from that positive perspective of letting go. And then about 30 years ago, we created a four-step process to forgiveness that is so freaking powerful. Um, I've used it in my own life. You know, yeah. Stacey, I've had people that have, have betrayed me very deeply mm. and, and I'll, I'll never forget one person, uh, betrayed me so deeply. And I remember for, and this was only about maybe seven years ago, I had been in a therapist for years and I remember for six months being so angry. And if someone ever brought up that person's name, I would go, Oh my God, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then one day I swear to God, Stacey, I looked in the mirror and I go, what the hell are you doing, David? You right. teach forgiveness. Right. You haven't even put an ounce of energy. It took me six months of doing the program, the yeah. four-step program. Do you know that at the six-month mark, now this is God stuff or something, I ran into, I hadn't seen her in years. Oh my God, you ran into her. I ran into her. And she looked at me like with bi <laughs> the biggest eyes, like, oh my God, he's going to rip my head off. And, <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, I have no idea. It's been a couple years since I've seen you. 
would I be able to give you a hug? And she wow. looked at me and she said, what? And I said, you don't have to accept it. And That's she said, big. no, but I know that you're really upset with me. And I said, I was absolutely. And she said, I'm really sorry for what I did. And I said, thank you. I said, but I'm good. Wow. And if you're willing to accept it, and she did, she came over, I hugged her. Do you know that I have been her therapist with her new boyfriend? <laughs> wow. So we came full circle. I forgave her completely. I didn't need her to say, I'm sorry, because I did the work. And that's what we teach people. You can come to forgiveness and closure, complete closure without the other person even knowing you're doing it. That's and Stacy, here's something. I helped a woman whose father died 30 years prior to when I worked with her. Yeah. I helped her forgive him because she had carried the burdens of his mistreatment for 30 years. Right. Wow. And, and, and so we were, and she said, well, what's the sense of doing forgiveness? He's dead. And I said, because forgiveness is only for you. It's yeah. never for the other person. Exactly. And I think that's when you hold the most guilt and the most emotion is when the person passes because now it's, it's a done deal and you can't change anything. You can't say anything to that person, whatever is whatever. And, yeah. you know, tell me those four steps. Cause I, I have to hear those four steps. What are oh, the four you, steps of forgiveness? Yeah. They're, for, they're for, now, now I will, I'm going to, I'm going to caution people and say this, this is the work of therapy in the work of therapy. There's work that we do that the average person would say that doesn't make sense. That's right. bizarre. Right. I would never do that only because a lot of people don't understand what we do in therapy, right? Right. But not, now that I've said that, I'll, I'll give you the step. Step number one is that we write letters of anger and frustration mm -hmm. at the person who we don't want to forgive in order to release that pent yeah. up rage, resent, right? So it would be, dear mom, dear Bob, dear husband, dear wife, dear boyfriend, whatever their name might be, right? I am so pissed off that last Saturday at six o'clock, you did the same thing you do every Saturday. You got so drunk, you couldn't go to our son's baseball game. Or And then we write down all the specifics, Stacey, everything that that person did that hurt you, disappointed you, whatever it might be, right? And we write to a point that's called desensitization, mm -hmm. a fancy term. And all it means is we write to a point where we're bored as hell and we have nothing else to say. You got okay? it all out. You've got it all out. And then clients will come in and go, David, I've been writing these letters for a month and I am bored as hell. And I'll go, great, let's go to step two. Step two now, and this is where we know if people have really gotten rid of the anger, is that you write letters of forgiveness where I forgive you for, right. and you write down the exact things that you just wrote a month about that you were angry with. So right. everything is very specific, right? I forgive you for on Saturday nights, at six o'clock being so drunk that you couldn't attend our son's baseball game, you know? Yeah. And now when we write the forgiveness, we write it very slowly. I forgive you. And then I ask people to stop and I want them to breathe in the forgiveness. I forgive you. And then write what we're forgiving them for. Now, sometimes Stacy, what happens is people will write all their anger and rage letters and they'll say, I'm ready for forgiveness. And the very first day they try to write a forgiveness letter, they can't right. because they haven't gotten to the depth of their anger. So we right. take them back to phase one and they rewrite the anger until they can actually write the forgiveness letters. Yeah. Then they write forgiveness letters, which may take a month, right? right? All right. Then step three, we write about our role in the dysfunction with that person, because no matter if someone betrayed you, cheated on you, lied to you. We have a role somewhere. Right. We like they were mistreating us for four years earlier and we stayed with them because we're codependent. They had given us all the signs in the beginning that they weren't a good match, but we were lonely. Right. So we call ourselves out for being lonely and not strong enough to be happy alone. Right. So I love it. We, we call ourselves out for yeah. anything that has to do with that person. That's step three. Right. Then step four, we do the same thing in step two. We forgive ourselves for each individual discretion that we created that led to part of the breakdown of the relationship. Now, this four-step process to forgiveness 
it might take some people six weeks, eight weeks. It may take other people six months. It depends right. on the depth of the anger, Stacey. Yes. But but we have we have so many past clients that have no anger at individuals that have stolen from them, lied to them, cheated on them, betrayed them, hit them. I mean, listen, the I could tell you a ton of stories, but I'll tell you one of the most intense because I just got a message from her yesterday. Yeah. About eight years ago, a woman reached out to me because she was raped and left for dead. Oh, wow. She had become agoraphobic, which means she couldn't leave her house. Yeah. She was on the heaviest antidepressant, anti-anxiety, wow. uh, anti-psychotic medication. She was a zombie. She hadn't left her house in eight years. Oh, wow. And she reached out to me and said, David, I've worked with eight other counselors. I can't seem to get anywhere. I've followed you on Facebook. Could we work together? So it took about a month to get her in the office because she had not left her house in, in forever, eight yeah. years. And we did the work. But here's the coolest thing. Now, imagine this. You've been raped and left for dead. Yeah. I worked with her for a year. Stacy. the last 30 days, she was writing forgiveness letters to the rapist in jail. Wow. Praying for him. Oh, wow. That he connects deeply with God and never does this for to anyone else again. Do you know that when this gentleman died in jail, she was in tears. She wow. had forgiven, forgiven him so deeply. But, yeah. And so, you know, it doesn't matter what the discretion is. It doesn't matter how deep and how terrible. This is probably one of the most difficult cases I've had in 43 years. And by following the program, she ended up praying for the man who tried to kill her for God's sake. Wow. So the the program works. I'll never change it. It's worked for 30 no. years and we're going to we're going to keep going. It's amazing. I, you know, just hearing that, like, just makes me at all. I just, you know, but I understand the, 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 the steps that you're taking. I think that's wonderful because you're able to release all those emotions that you repressed for so long. And those emotions are causing other other issues like they can cause depression. They can cause yes. anxiety. You know, yes. when you're not releasing your emotions and you keep repressing your emotions, you open the doors to other other conditions and other illnesses just to walk right in. And then all of a sudden, yeah. lots of other things start happening. And I'm sure that you've worked with a lot of anxiety patients yes. and a lot of people that are depressed because they're stuck either in these relationships or in situations that they're not happy with. And maybe they're not happy as a person or maybe they're right. just not happy with the life around them. But yeah. when you see a client come in and they're suffering from anxiety or depression, how do you work with that patient? And what would you suggest to try to get them you know, the first, the steps on how to get themselves mm -hmm. back to a healthy living environment where they feel happy, healthy, and productive? Stacy, there's a beautiful quote that I, I don't know who made it, but I saw it on social media. And it says, sometimes you have to do things that will break your heart, but free your soul. Right. <clears throat> And think about the power of that statement. Powerful. You know, there's a lot of relationships that should not be relationships. There's a yeah. lot of people that have been treating each other poorly for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. They shouldn't be together, right? Yeah. Oh, and definitely. so some and and that, and you met you said it so beautifully. When you're in a dysfunctional, unhappy relationship, depression and anxiety are your two probably best friends. Uh third would be addiction when we're unhappy, we're going to look for escape routes, right? We're going to look for yeah. anything other than doing the work. Right. Uh, we're, we're going to look to try to mollify the brain that's upset with sugar, nicotine, pot, alcohol, TV, spending, social media, whatever it might be, right? We're going to be looking for ways to lift ourselves because we're in a toxic environment, right. whether that toxic environment is a relationship or work or we're a family. You know, I just worked with a woman um, who her mother is like in her eighties, they've, they've been at each other's throats ever since the child was born. The mom had no maternal connection with her whatsoever. And this woman is now in her fifties and she's finally decided to end the relationship with her mom. Right. You know, it was so toxic. We worked together for six months. I never give people advice unless I feel where they're going is horrendous. Yeah. I ask questions because I want to empower our clients to make the right decisions. Right. So, you know, I asked her, would she like to go through the forgiveness program for her mom? She said, absolutely. We did. She did a phenomenal job. But at the end of it, she said, you know what, David, 
my mom has treated me like this since I was born. She's in her eighties. She'll never change. Yeah. So I feel I've forgiven her completely. And the only thing I'm going to tell her is that I'm not available. If you hit an emergency, let me know. But other than that, I'm not an av available. Now, some people may say that's cold, that's harsh, but we have not walked in that woman's shoes. Exactly. We do not know. We don't have a clue. So other people would say, oh my God, she's 80. She's an old woman. Give her a break. We Listen, there's a lot of 80-year-olds who are complete assholes. Excuse yes. my, my, my French. No, you know? I agree. And, and so, no, you can't say because someone is this age or this gender or this whatever that we, you know, give them a break. We say, no, if giving them a break means giving me a break, I need to do the right thing for me. Yeah. Now, and here's the other thing that we've seen so many times, Stacey, a lot of times when someone leaves the, their family or leaves the marriage or leaves whatever it might be, that may be the straw that breaks the camel's back to get the other people to wake up and to look at what they're doing. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and people don't realize it, but you know, I see people make judgments about other people all the time, but until you walk through that person's shoes, until you've experienced life through their eyes, you can't judge other individuals. And it goes on all the time, but sometimes you do, you have to take a step back from the toxic people in your life because yeah. toxicity is just like a, a negative energy and negative energies will pull you down and, and it will hurt you in many ways, mentally, physically, spiritually, the whole, the whole to do, you know, and. Oh, it, it, it's so true. And, you know, when we're talking anxiety and depression, one of the first exercises we give people is we ask them to write down every day what they watch, listen to, and read. Yeah. Exact. I, I want to know exactly what you're reading, exactly what you're watching, exactly what you're listening to, right? Because right. that creates either a positive approach to the world oh, yeah. or a scarcity approach, which is filled with depression, anxiety, et cetera. So, you know, a lot of people that are very clued into conspiracy theories, the news, social media arguing, these people are all struggling with anxiety and depression. Yeah. They're all struggling with poor attitudes, you know? So what you watch, listen to, and read is huge. And then the last component, which I have them do an exercise in is who do I hang out with on a regular basis? And what do they bring to my life that's positive? And what do they bring to my life that's challenging? Yeah. So then I get them to do all of this data and they bring it in, Stacey. And it's very easy for them to see the changes they need to make. Now, the changes may not be easy, but it's easy for them to see, geez, all I watch on TV is the news. I'm always pissed off at the Republicans. I'm always pissed off at the Democrats. I'm always, hmm, I wonder if we should stop watching the news. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll even say during COVID, when I when I started listening to the news, it started making me feel very depressed. It started giving me anxiety. So I had to just shut the news off and not listen anymore. And people said, did you hear about that, 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 that? And I'll be like, no, I didn't. And I'm doing good. <laughs> and I'm fine. And I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. I, I don't need to. I, I got the gist of it. That's all I need to know. <laughs> I love that. Good move on your part. Yeah. You know, I learned in, even in my own past experiences, it was hard, but you know what? I got to a point in my life where I knew I needed positive change in my life. And I did exactly what you said. I looked, I saw the people around me. I saw the life I was leading and I had to let go of any toxic people in my environment, no matter if I liked them or not, they were toxic in some way. And I knew they were pulling me down. So it was hard, but it helped me become stronger and better as a person. That's so it is, a, it is a hard thing to do, but in the end, it will actually help you gain the strength, the courage, the mentality in everything else you need to better yourself as a whole. And Stacey, when you do what you just said, when you let people go or you decrease your involvement with them by 80%, sometimes you don't have to let them go. You just, right. You're just not, exactly. not going to interact that much, right? Yeah. But here's the cool thing. You've just opened up a doorway for someone to come in and lift you to a higher level. You've yes. just opened up a doorway to be filled with someone who brings to you some beauty, grace, whatever it might be, yes. right? And you want positive people. I always look for people who are at a higher zone than I am because they give me the inspiration to say, one day I would love to be at that spot yes. where they're at. And it gives yes. me, you set, for me, I would set short-term and long-term goals and say, you know what? I want to be there one day. I'm going to try. And yeah. you, know, you don't have to get there. 
but the the fact that you actually gave yourself a goal and you're trying is, yeah. is a lot, is a lot. Yeah, absolutely right on. So, you know, people don't have to reach their goals. Just trying and going in the right direction can play a big yeah. role too, don't you think? I agree 100%. It automatically changes the mindset. You know, it, it, and I like that non-attachment to the end result, right? Non-attachment. So you set a goal, yes. you do the work, but you're not attached. You know, Stacy, I started writing books like 25 years ago, I think. For the first 20 years, we got no recognition at all. We sold hardly nothing. Right. Uh, you, you know, no endorsements. I mean, nothing. I just yeah. kept writing and I just kept writing. On the 21st year, we got our first number one bestseller. Yeah. And the and the last four and the the our most recent book. Um, Show I me, I want to see it. it. Yeah, I. You know what? Hold on. All right, go, 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 go. Okay. And this book is our most recent. I like it. And it just went number one last week. Yes. Hey. So I, I share that with you and the audience because for 20 years, I got no validation as a writer, but that didn't stop me. Right. If you need to lose 200 pounds, don't let the scale stop you from doing the right work. Right. If you need to forgive someone, don't let your small ego stop you from doing the work. If right. it takes six months or a year to forgive a mom or a dad who treated you horrendously, still keep doing the work. Right. Don't get attached because you've started the work that it should come at a certain time. Yeah. You know, like those programs that say, you know, lose 90 pounds in 90 days and yeah. all that kind of crap, right? Yeah. And then at the end of 90 days, they didn't lose the 90 pounds and they give up and they gain more. Right. So let's just do the work and everything else will take care of itself. I promise yeah. you. And, you know, I feel like as Americans, we are brainwashed by the media to think that everything has to be quick and it's right. fast. And That's we right. expect it because we see it all the time. We see those info commercials. We see the commercials on TV. We see everything on the internet, the advertisements. And we think everything's supposed to happen one, two, three, but it doesn't. If you no. want something really good to happen in your life, it takes time, but little by baby steps, little yes. by little by little. Now tell me about your website and tell me about everything that you offer. So people will know where to contact you and they'll know all the services you provide. Awesome, Stacey. You know, the, the website is so easy to remember. Talkdavid.com. Talk, David, because all I do is talk, Stacey. So I'm it's an appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I can tell. <laughs> so talkdavid.com. You know, we have multiple programs there. We, as we mentioned, you know, we work with everything from grieving to weight loss to addiction recovery to financial freedom. I mean, there isn't a topic we don't cover. And here's something that we do a little different, Stacey. When people join us, they join me and they work with me for either two or three months at a time because it always takes at least two or three months for people to start to see progress. Right. But the cool thing is I work with people one day a week for an hour via a Skype or Zoom or phone or in person, whatever works. But we offer our availability five days a week. Oh, so wonderful. when someone contacts and says, I'm going to join David's three month program. Yeah, they have access to me, not just the one hour a week. But five days, they can reach out via text, ask questions, get support. If they go, geez, you know, I tried this. It's not working. Do you have any other ideas? So we believe in offering the highest level of accountability. So it's not just the one hour a week. We are available Monday through Friday. So our clients can reach out and say, I got stuck on this homework assignment or, hey, I got to share this with you. It worked great. You know, whatever it is, I want people to feel supported five days a week. Yeah. So go to talkdavid.com. All of our books are there. Uh, we work with people from all over the world. And if there's something that you really would love to see change, and I'm going to make a statement here that's going to sound a little bizarre, but whenever you have a goal, if you have at least a 10% desire to achieve that goal, that's all you need, Stacey. Yeah. People say, well, I'm not ready to quit drinking or I'm not ready to lose weight or I'm not ready to start looking at my finances. No one is ever ready to look at that no. crap in life. We're never ready. So I just say, do you have a 10% desire to get sober? And they say, yes. I say, we're in it. Do you have a 10% desire to build your business? Well, I have a 20% or a 50%. Awesome. You're in. I as long that. as you have a 10% desire to change, we can help. Because you hear so many times people will say, oh, you have to hit rock bottom. You have to be 100% willing to change or it's not possible. So I like that. Yeah. Just no. And, and, and what you're saying is dead on. You don't have to hit rock bottom. 
You don't you don't have to, have to do anything other than say, I'm going to follow this person. I'm going to find this professional and I'm going to do what they say to do. You know, it, it's surrendering to the process. And it's amazing when you find someone that you connect with energetically. It's yeah. incredible how you can heal quickly by doing this work. Oh, 100 percent. I love it. I love it. And you can find all your books, your services, everything on your website. And I'm sure you have like all your plat your social platforms listed on the website. Yes. You can follow you and everything. That's oh. wonderful. All right. One more time for the audience. The audience remembers your 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 website. Yeah, talkdavid.com for our books, to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. And remember, when we work together, you've got me five days a week, not just one. So go to talkdavid.com. And remember also, this is the day to change. You wouldn't be with Stacy and I if you weren't ready to change. So let's make it happen. And I'm here for you. Thank you so much, David. It's been an honor to speak with you. I love you. You give me so much energy just talking to you. <laughs> And it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Uh, Stacey, I have loved it too. You ask awesome questions. And if you ever need me again, the answer is yes. Oh, I love you. <laughs> Thank you so much. You have a great day. You too, Stacey. Bye now. Bye-bye.